uh, kind of what I have is a dream job, which is I wake up every morning and I think about how can I break my company? How can I blow stuff up? So I have a really great job because I put a lot of time and effort into this anticipating perhaps that folks might uh, come after us in cyberspace. Um, my background is uh, from the military. Uh, I was 12 years as a military police officer and then finally uh, I changed uh, professions to a public affairs officer which meant for me having no friends to having lots of friends. Um, I worked as the security architect and project manager for the Canadian Human Rights Museum and I learned a lot about advanced persistent threat. I learned a lot about the architecture that you can use and how you can apply it to even small medium businesses which are really at the tip of the spear right now when it comes to cybercrime, uh, specifically ransomware. And uh, we'll be talking a lot about that uh, moving forward. So this is what a day in information security feels like. Um, you're the elves by the way, the orcs are the bad guys. Um, and I really wish somebody would just have shot the one that had the torch, right? It would have been easier on everybody. The point is, is that this is the portrayal of the media with regards to the cybercrime problem. And actually, when you start looking at the numbers, and these numbers are 2015 numbers that came from us from IC3 in the United States, it isn't a malware problem. We don't have a malware problem. What we have is a bunch of fraud being committed by cyber criminals using the internet, and somehow that's now an IT security problem. If you are foolish enough to believe that a Nigerian prince has an inheritance for you and he's going to send you a check to see how your bank account, if it's working properly, and it's not even spelled nor is it actually addressed to you, I, I can't fix stupid, okay? It's beyond my powers. Um, and a lot of this stuff is hyped by industries that, you know, I'm a bit of a part of it, um, you know, all the vendors are a bit of a part of it. but. What the takeaway from this is, is that just by simply asking nicely for you to send me a money transfer, I'm making a lot of money doing that. No malware, none. I'm just doing something called business email compromise, where I pretend I'm the CEO or the CTO, and I tell you to transfer money immediately. And that's working. And the problem is, is that when we try to go after this kind of situation, it's not a technical problem. It's a user that perhaps was acting in the best interests of the company. Um, a CEO transferred 41 million Australian dollars to a Chinese firm and it subsequently the money disappeared and so did his job. So my point about this whole presentation is, yeah, malware is sexy, it's cool, we're going to look at some of it. The bottom line here is if you're not doing security awareness training, you're going to fail because I will beat you. As an attacker, I will beat you. Okay, you have to educate your people, and you know to underline what the ICO um, was saying about how when they come a calling, they're going to want to see that user awareness training program that you have, that you were downloading just before the meeting, for the, the ICO. And I would say to uh, my ICO colleague, it would be really great if you visited Yahoo's corporate headquarters soon, because I think you could probably make another 400k pretty easily. So. We get stuff like this in the media, and I'm going to call these guys out because they sent out this sensationalized $6 trillion in cybercrime by 2021. Yet the entire G20 online economy is projected to be about $13.75 trillion. And I'm telling you right now, if their predictions come true, we're out of business. Everybody here that's working on the internet webs. The problem is, is that this kind of stuff does not help us. It does not help us because it's inaccurate. And case in point, there was a recent study that came out by a backup vendor that suggested that ransomware was a $75 billion problem in the United States. According to the FBI, they say it's a billion dollar problem. So again, what is it? 75 or 1 billion? We don't know. That's the other problem. Every vendor that does these surveys of a thousand customers to find out that they're just a thousand bad customers when it comes to cybersecurity ends up putting out a report that makes no sense when you do the math. This is our major problem. Okay? It's passwords. It's crappy. It's been a problem for 30 years. But this, in a lot of cases, is what's leading us to our problem. Because a certain search provider and email provider was, I believe, pretty negligent in letting 500,000 
user IDs and passwords out on the internet. Which, unfortunately, if you're my mom, you're using a password for everything. One password. So if one breach is compromised, we get this rolling problem of breaches. LinkedIn, Carbonite, uh, what was the other one? Uh, TeamViewer and uh, GitHub, all breached. Why? Password reuse, okay? You, wanna, you want good security in your business? Password manager. Get a password manager. Really important point. What I like to do for this is it, if you're not using two-factor authentication for your cloud services, you're probably dead. You're going to die. It's, it's just not possible to use a hosted services without two-factor authentication. And don't save your passwords in your browsers. Because in a TeamViewer breach, what did the bad guys do? They logged onto your machine and they used the passwords inside your browser to conduct all sorts of fraud. Okay? So don't save it. And for God's sakes, don't have customer passwords.xls on your desktop. We're going to talk about that. So if you want to find malware, it's really easy. Look for stolen content. Anything.torrent, want to download software, anything like that. One third of the websites that host stolen content are going to hose your endpoint. Chances are, 54% of the time, it's Trojan. And about 99.9% .9 of the time, that Trojan is ransomware. Oh yeah, it's going to get you. So that's the other problem, because if you're doing this kind of thing at work, yeah, that's a problem. So being proactive in IT security comes down to certainly putting some sort of web filtering in. Our next problem, email, okay? And in the, in the actual cases that I've investigated for folks and in conjunction with law enforcement, we're going to talk about uh, one of those coming up shortly. Um, it was an email attachment that a user accessing their personal email launched into the environment. Because when you think about security, and this goes back to that user awareness training, it doesn't go out of the people as soon as they, as soon as they open the door and exit the business. It works at home, it works on their mobile, user awareness training, it's a three for one bonus, okay? Act now. The point here is, is that it's email that is a problem. About 77% of the attacks, of the ransomware attacks coming in are email related, okay? So if you're gonna put money into some sort of piece of technology, this, email, filter it, okay? Very helpful, because this is what it is. So, this is an example of CryptoLocker, okay? And it was pretty vicious. It was an older version that delivered its payload using something called Visual Basic, okay? basically just a script that this piece, when clicked on, downloaded the crypto locker onto the endpoint, okay? What was the exploit? The human. The human was the problem. And so you can see that we put in all these layered defenses. We had mail filtering. We had Office 365. We had Bitdefender. We had web protection. We had a fully patched and updated machine, and we'd removed admin rights. And there was a discussion about admin rights earlier. We'll talk about admin rights only work when you're working with an attachment. Web drive by download usually has privilege escalation. We'll talk about what that is. And it bypasses a firewall. Okay? Bam, 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 bam. That was it. So, let's think about this. It's not magical, right? It has to do, malware has to do a few things. It doesn't mysteriously appear, although that's what the user will say. I did nothing. Exploit a system vulnerability, user vulnerability for access. It's mostly user vulnerability, mostly. Not entirely, but mostly. Install some code in system memory, usually hijacking a process, or something like that, or spooling up a new process. Modify the registry of your WMI. It's a bit of a recap from our Kaspersky thing, going a little deeper. Generate network traffic to command and control. Possibly drop files on the system, although there is some ransomware out there that doesn't, is fileless. And run an encryption process against your machine. That's how it works. Now, if it's not doing the above, it's not malware, okay? so. Point number one, it's just a broken machine, all right? Now, the reality here is that we can look for this stuff. And we've been let down by the entire antivirus industry. And I'll show you why. Because when Lockheed Martin came out with the kill chain, what they're talking about is the various phases of how malware works. So we have the reconnaissance and weaponization. 
that might be a phishing attack, may not be. It might just be a random attack. It might be a bot attack. The weaponization of the payload, we'll talk about those in a second. Delivery, exploitation, installation, command and control, and actions. Okay? All easily preventable with different types of technology, except one, the user. Okay? The user will try and undo, undo all of your preventative measures. So let's talk about exploits. So hacking team, nefarious group from Italy, put together a surveillance software that they put onto endpoints, usually at the request of pretty nasty regimes. They sold zero days, and this was their price list from 2014. So we have a remote access code, multi-flash bypass, 100,000 US dollars, 100,000. Buy it today, I might throw in something else. This is expensive and hard work. Now, why do we know about this? Well, Phineas Fisher, a hacker, dumped 600 gigabytes of their intellectual property, including all, and mostly all, of the flash attacks that we're facing today. So this is why 80% of the exploit kits out there today are targeting flash, okay? So, you want to improve cybersecurity in your organization? Remove Adobe Flash, okay? You don't need it, you don't need to use it. Especially in a business environment, unless your business is actually watching pictures of cats dance on the internet, you don't need Adobe Flash. The much more traditional way of building malware is to take a patch, which is a set of instructions for something that is broken on the computer, and reverse engineer that, and attempt to figure out what it was trying to fix and seeing if it yields up what we call remote code exploitation. Chances are, if you can do that consistently, you have a bunch of options. If you're a white hat person, you can sell that for a bug bounty, which I really wish Cisco would come out with one, rather than subcontracting all that work to the NSA. Okay, but the point here is, is that then that is sold on the criminal underground to the bot herders that essentially then spray it out there. This happens with the agile program development life cycle that you guys are taught. The same cyber criminal are using the same methodology. They're not using waterfall methodology anymore. They're using agile. They scrum. They have all that stuff too. And they try to put out a new version of this about every seven days. So if you're waiting for the monthly patch, you're probably host. Okay? So little bit of stuff about exploit kits, you buy them. This is where the true cyber criminal money making is. It's on getting the malware onto the endpoints in any way, shape, or you can. Download recorded futures analysis on uh, exploit kits. Really, really interesting reading. They hose the endpoint with a number of different types of attacks. It's great to understand how the attackers work, and it's great to understand that Adobe Flash is the most popular thing that they're exploiting. And there's lots of good stuff out there on the internet. If you, if you um, Google uh, ransomware prevention toolkit, lots of stuff, good stuff, something to think about. So, this is probably the most important slide in the presentation. Not the most fun one, but the most important one. This shows all the different pieces of our technology that we have and how it maps to the various phases of malware when it lands onto a machine. So this thing here is the kind of thing that I go to my boss and say, I have nothing to look at preventing installation of malware on endpoints. Could I maybe look at a technology? Is there a GPO that we could do that? Or maybe could we just remove administrative user rights from our users, right? There's a bunch of different things. So think about this uh, because malware goes through all of these phases. And why is command and control so important? It's important because I want to gather the stats of my infections. Because the more things that I can affect, the more successful I am as a cyber criminal, the more money I get to make by selling my exploit kits to other people. Okay? So command and control is critical not only for the function of uh, the malware itself, but also for the cyber criminal industry. That's why taking down command and control has to be a number one priority of national uh, crime agencies. So let's look at payloads. Now, this is really interesting. So I don't know right now, I know in the United States under HIPAA, if you have a ransomware attack as a clinic, you have to report it. Because unbeknownst, the latest versions of CryptoLocker want to establish um, 
coming back for another payment, okay? So they're stealing all sorts of credentials, okay? They want that information because they really want to not feed from you once, but like a little vampire, come back every couple of months and see what more money they can take from the organization, okay? So this is one of the things. So when you think you, ransomware is over because you've restored your files and you ran malware bytes like everybody probably does in the room to try and get rid of the infection um, or rebuild the machine from scratch, the point is, is that the cyber criminals will be leaving a way of getting back in there. So. Let's talk a little bit about CryptoLocker. I, I made mention of the fact that customer, uh, customer XLS passwords are a bad idea. Yes, they are. Uh, because if that endpoint gets hosed, all the person's customers now might get hosed. And that's exactly what happened. So here's the culprit. This is the Trojan that was used in the attack. Okay, And uh, there's going to be a, po a point here where anybody that's in the antivirus industry is not going to be real happy. But I'll show you this. Anyways. Ran the analysis on 2016-01-24, and guess what? Seven out of 54 commercial antivirus engines detected it. Seven. Seven. Okay? This was from 2012. Okay? The Trojan was used in t back in 2012. Now, I bet you the Kaspersky guy's really happy to see his name up there. But the good news is, is well, sadly, sometimes you can do other stuff with this thing too, and I'll show you why. In 2016-05-31, it then was now being detected by 37 out of 56 commercial antivirus engines, okay? Still less than half, you know, five months after the attack started taking place. So what does that tell you? It tells me it's not an isolated incident. It tells me that this is a cyber criminal campaign. Ooh, goody, real bad guys, okay? Awesome. So then I started playing with the Trojan itself, and I learned a couple of things about the deplorable state of antivirus. By renaming the file, <laughs> And um, I'm going to show you in the next screen, changing it a little bit, not a lot, I was able to reduce the detection rate down to 22 out of 53, right? So how did I do it? Well, I'm not an Uber hacker. I opened up a hex editor, and I copy and pasted some of the binary, passed all these zeros that were there, and put part of the fragment of the file in there, OK? So that's why you know, my advice for antivirus vendor of choice is similar to the advice I give to your cell phone provider, go with the one you hate the least, okay? The point here is, is that this was not an uber hack thing, but the, you could see the tremendous drop off in detection rate by just doing these two steps. And what I could do is refine my attack and I could put it through more and more iterations. Who knows anything about cryptography and entropy? Anyone? Bueller? Okay. Um, I'll just give you, the reason the zeros are there is if you're dealing with what's called a cryptid binary, we introduce a whole bunch of zeros to remove entropy from the file so that antivirus engines that look at something that goes, ooh, it's encrypted, I'm not going to run it. It's how we bypass that one safe, safeguard when we're attacking. So a couple things about this thing. Um, the attack came from an IP address somewhere in a European country. And the actual platform that delivered the ransomware payload was in another country. And we had um, a whole bunch of different uh, countries. This is the ransomware key. Unfortunately, it changed each and every time. So it wasn't a process of running the ransomware, grabbing the key, and unencrypting the files, although there are ransomware variants out there that you can do that. But look at this. They're using infrastructure, hosted infrastructure, in Germany, Netherlands, Hong Kong through a VPN provider, Singapore through a VPN provider, UK, Spain, and Russia. The Russian IP address, the only telemetric data we have from our good friends at Kaspersky, um, tell us that um, that one point in time, that IP address in Russia was used to send out a whole bunch of spam that had a ransomware campaign attributed to it. Okay, So this is why the other little FUD bomb that I want to leave you with, there are only two agencies that you should pay attention to in terms of attribution. One is the NCA and the other is the Department of Justice in the United States. Just because it may look Russian does not necessarily mean it's Russian. However, this, for you network layer people, you should understand this because simply banning all traffic from Russia will not save you from the cyber criminals. 
All right, payload analysis. Let's um, talk a little bit about how we did this. So this is a copy of a piece of ransomware that was sent to one of our internal employees at the company, bypassed all the defenses. It was really kind of interesting because this one was named for the actual user, right? Cool. Would you not be more inclined to click on something that was named in your name? See, there's psychology there, right? So um, it's nasty. Um, wanted to point out, so 35 out of 56 antivirus engines uh, uh, detected it. Uh, six out of 68 network, uh, network security layer um, detected it only. Six out of 68. Maybe uh, the vendors need to do some work there. Anyways. Um, let's go here. Okay, I think I can hit play and I'll walk you through this analysis. How are we doing for time? Oh, perfect. Okay, can I go back? Okay, and there should be a play bar here. Yes, there it is. Fantastic. Are we playing? Okay. No problem. Okay, I'm just going to walk you through it. So this is a Windows XP machine. We take our malware, and for God's sakes, we don't do this inside the corporate network. Okay? Rule number one about um, playing with malware, do not do it, especially ransomware, inside the corporate network. So in the DMZ, on a dedicated machine that has no file shares, none. Okay? That's super important. Two pieces of software that we're using for this analysis, we use RedShot. All it does is take a snapshot of the registry before we run our malware, and then we run the snapshot after the malware has run. And what we're trying to do there is see what it's doing, how it's hiding, how it works. The other thing that we're really interested in is Wireshark data. So what we're trying to do here is see it calling out to the command and control server. The command and control server goes, hello um, Trojan, you're new. I am going to hose the endpoint with ransomware. So uh, now with a get request from the bad, uh, from, the, from the Trojan, does a get request for that ransomware payload and pulls it down and sends up the stats of the infection, whether or not it was successful. So um, just I put these tools in here to do more advanced malware analysis. Uh, it'll be in the slide deck and uh, it will certainly be useful for you if you want to start playing with malware. Uh, highly recommend these tools here. Uh, Cuckoo, Thug, Bro, Volatility, and Ida Pro. Um, we, used to, we used to laugh and call it, it was uh, um, uh, burn Monday, which is where you dumped all of your um, evil uh, software to bug bounties, and then uh, Patch Tuesday, when Microsoft comes out with all of their patches, and then Ida Pro Wednesday, where we all started reversing the patches to see what the next set of malware uh, would infect. So, um, this is, um, you also have to listen to heavy metal music while you do this. It's sort of mandatory. But, my point is, is um, the first thing you want to do if you have a piece of malware that you think is malware is check with VirusTotal to see if they've seen it before. It can be very useful. Um, and then you just basically do a VM snapshot first, okay? Because otherwise you're going to infect it and you're going to go, oh, oh, <laughs> I can't roll back. Um, you know, you do a registry shot, Wireshark on, infect your machine. Red shot to compare, observe the Wireshark traffic, and you can trace the IP address to the home country for, um, for giggles. Um, and then restore your uh, VMware uh, snapshot. But, you know, what's really interesting about this is that we might get all replaced at some point. So this is uh, Project Mayhem. Uh, that was Carnegie Mellon's contribution this year at DEF CON. I'm a sock goon, so if you're ever at DEF CON, wave at me. I'll be the guy wrangling a line of 17,000 people that are all dressed in black t-shirts and cargo pants and never talk about anything of what they're doing. Anyways, fun crowd. Uh, the point, though, is, is that they put together an automated way of looking at software, building an exploit for that software, and then patching that software. Now, the good news is that Carnegie Mellon team won $2 million with this, um, and all of the machines played against each other. But when this machine was turned loose on real hackers, um, it was totally gutted. <laughs> so there is some hope. But the point is, is, and I thought there was maybe a bit of an American policy uh, moment here, where they publicly displayed this kind of capability. It's a little chilling. It's sort of like autonomous warfare, but in cyberspace. So um, yeah, hello, uh, new era. So some conclusions. Um, 
Yeah. Industry-wide studies are helpful, but you should look to your law enforcement and government policy agencies for the truth of the matter, okay? Cybersecurity essentials works, right? 80% was what came out of the cybersecurity essential studies. 80% of the attacks can be mitigated by cybersecurity essentials. And it's like, do five things, okay? It's not impossible. We can get way better at this. The most important thing though is in your careers and in your um, progression, uh, and it's report cybercrime, okay? Because if, from the government perspective, if it's not reported, it doesn't exist. So this is what happened in the United States. Everybody was running around like your chicken with their head cut off, going ransomware, 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 and the FBI goes, eh, we don't know, because nobody's reporting it. It's petty theft, okay? That's the problem. It's like two, three hundred quid, whatever. It's like throwing a brick through, the, through your cyber window, okay? You're not going to get, you know, armed police, armed police for, the, for that kind of offense, right? So the point here is, is that report it so that the powers that be can make policy and fund organizations and agencies uh, that can't le levy 400,000 quid fines and help help solve the problem. So one of the most important thing is not, not focus on the cost of the breach or the, the magnitude of the breach, like the 500,000 uh, or 500, half a million user IDs and passwords. Think about the consequences, you know? $400,000 fine or 400,000 quid fine? Yeah, I would have sold them a web application firewall to prevent SQL injection for that price. I mean, come on, right? So you just have to think about the, the consequences. The other thing is architecture. The architect that was talking about the, the school network, and I, I did a little exploring this afternoon on it. It's kind of neat. They got some cool stuff going on there. The point that I'm trying to make is that segmentation of your network is probably one of the most fundamental areas of cybersecurity, right? If a machine, I'll give you a great example. My mom got tricked into this and uh, it was really interesting. Guy calls up from Microsoft and we all know that it's impossible to get Microsoft on the phone. They never call you. Um, so that should be tip number one. But number two is, you know what they did is they didn't actually install any malware or anything like that. And I was watching them because I was there. I was going, mom, this is going to be great. Let's see what they do. They used the um, Windows help feature to send a remote desktop request back. So no malware in the attack. So they got remote access through the help feature, which is where you send in a little RDP session back, right? And then they started looking at the computer and all computers have errors on them, unless you're like really like super Mr. robot -y and you like go through your event log and fix everything in your event log. And he was telling me in his deep Indian accent that, um, that you know, oh, the machine is infected, you need to download semantic. They were pumping semantic antivirus, which I was like, holy moly. But it was like quadruple the price. It was great. They had it all, you know, right down to the, oh, this is very bad. Oh, I have not seen this. This is very bad. So anyways, the point here is, is that if you don't educate people about these type of attacks, it's low level stuff that is hosing us all the time. The other thing is, who thinks putting printers directly on the internet is a great idea? Yeah, no, it's not. It's a bad idea. It's so bad that there's a notorious hacker named Weave. He also happens to be a white supremacist. He made every HP printer that was on the internet on port 9600, which is the HP uh, management port, print out swastikas and giant penises. So funny, but concerning. So please don't put your printers directly out on the internet. All right, we're almost done here. This is the other thing. So you network people. At your firewall, you can do so much. You can egress filter a lot of the stuff that is making it very easy for me to land my malware on the endpoint by tricking the user. But if I have difficulty coming back to the command and control, all my evil is for naught. If I can't get into the system. So even though you've got crazy users that will click on anything, if you're really good at isolating and segmenting your network and writing firewall rules that make sense, so I'll give you a great example. This is perfect. So you've got a bunch of workstations and you have a server, okay? So normal networks, it's everybody's like, oh cool, DNS, right. So the server has DNS, the workstation has DNS. Why 
do we not write a firewall that says only workstations can talk to only this DNS server? So that when we have a workstation that tries to use a DNS server in Pakistan, we suddenly know, hey, that's a problem, because it showed up in our firewall log. It's pretty simple stuff, right? Um, turn off some protocols that only hackers use, like IRC. IRC shouldn't be used in a business. It's probably used in the university a lot, because you guys are all hacker wannabes. But the point here is, is that you can turn off protocols in a business environment. OK, where are we? OK, so layered security for the win, but fundamentals, folks, right? You can do all sorts of this. You got to have backup. No security solution is good without backup. So the first thing you do as like a new cybersecurity hire is you talk to them and you say, I need a summer intern who only does backup. That's their job. They come in 8 in the morning until, <laughs> until 5 and they make sure your backups are all good to go. Okay, that's fun, n number one, right? Chances are you'll never get to do a new build in your life. You're going to come in to somebody else's shit show. So the first thing you have to do is back it up. Then, you know, look at a user awareness training. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. It can just be an email that says don't open attachments from people you don't know. It just has to be there and it's something that is a huge win because like I said, it'll work at home, it'll work abroad, it will work in the business and not. And then, you know, patch and update and harden and deploy antivirus and web protection and your mail protection. But above all, expect me, okay? Expect me to come in and try and write, rip apart your network and make your day miserable, okay? And, and this is the thing that, I, that I, I see the most, and it's where the blood drains out of people, is when you get the pen test result, and it was like, not only did just one person compromise the network, probably about 30 employees out of 100 compromised the network by clicking on the damn attachment. A week after we had the cybersecurity user awareness training, they said, don't click on the damn attachments. Okay. Enough rant. I wrote a book, well not really, it's a downloadable PDF thing. It has a lot of stuff on the like attacks and all the different types of attacks and really what you should look for in terms of defense against it and whether or not you should even care about it. Like network probes and scans, right? You, our firewall is always getting hit with this kind of stuff and if you're up late at night because something is pinging you from China, I'm telling you, you're, you're going to be not long for this world if you care about that stuff. Care about what's going on internally and what's trying to get out. That's the secret. And um, yeah, that's it. I think I'm done and got time for a couple questions. This, by the way, is that proof of concept IoT ransomware. This is really neat. Um, the hacker demonstrated that not only could they break into it, but they could jack it to 99.9 .9 degrees Fahrenheit. Which I thought was really neat because, you know, if you're in, say, Texas and you turn on the heating system in, say, an old folks home, you can see where this is going, right? You probably kill some people. And this was the thing that struck me the most is that if we're cavalier about this Internet of Things when it comes to cybersecurity, government's not going to solve the problem. No. Nope. Police aren't going to solve the problem. The vendors certainly have shown no inclination to solve the problem whatsoever. In fact, you could say they're the root of the problem. Insurance litigation, that's going to solve the problem. So there is hope for the Internet of Things. It's when they start doing stuff like the largest criminal fraud perpetrated by software ever. You guys know what I'm talking about? VW. VW found out just how important software is to their business to the tune of several billion dollars in fines that are being considered. So think about that because I think the time will be coming when if our dishwasher suddenly decides to only pump water and flood out you know, basements in our flats, then guess what? All of a sudden there's going to be insurance litigation and you'll find some strong requirements for cybersecurity. Nice.